<laughs> Greetings, mammalians. Welcome to Wall Street Wildlife. The investing podcast that will help you better understand how to make money in the stock market. Um, Christoph Monkey Pikarski. And I'm Luke the Badger Hallard. And this morning we are graciously joined by our resident vulture, Mr. Not Advice. It's been a little while, so we'll be very happy to hear from him about uh, all the ways the world is going to hell. Yeah. <laughs> and, we, and it was such a sunny, optimistic conversation last month. I'm really looking forward to this one. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, but before we get into that, Christoph, uh, Bitcoin has been in the news. Uh, it looked like it was almost going to make all-time highs. Now it seems to be retracting a bit. What's going on? How do you think about Bitcoin right now? Yeah, so a little bit of a background about Bitcoin. Who is it that's interested in Bitcoin? And I think the big picture is uh, that our money system, our financial system that runs on fiat currency, meaning, meaning currency that nation states can print at will and print as much of whenever they want due to, I would say, human greed. Uh, they print often much more of it than than they need and so what ends up happening is you get large debt uh cycles i guess you could call it for short and we're in a situation now where you know between massive amounts of debt and countries suffering from hyperinflation there's a there's a i would call a global crisis around money itself and we used to be on the gold standard but uh lots of political things happened and now the country does not run on gold. In other words, for every dollar you print, you do not need to have some amount of gold to back it up. So uh, in 2008, these cryptographers and mathematicians discovered a technology called blockchain, which allows essentially a form of money to be based on uh, mathematically secure proofs that the transactions are made can be verified and the big deal here is that there is a hard limit to how many bitcoins can ever be made and this is what for many people makes bitcoin a more attractive proposition than gold it's almost like like gold except better in the ways that technology can make things more portable faster more accessible with no inflation and whatever other qualities that good money has, according to some economists. So that's the background why people are interested in Bitcoin. But then recently, last week, uh, a big step forward from some perspectives occurred because a bunch of big money funds are now uh, legally capable of investing in Bitcoin through ETFs. So one of the issues outstanding issues is that bitcoin was still kind of on the edge of a frontier it's a technological advancement and it wasn't easy it wasn't accessible to anyone i mean it was accessible technically to anyone but you kind of had to have some chops behind you to buy bitcoin on wallets or use these alternate crypto exchanges but we found out of course over the last couple of years there were all sorts of fraud frauds and disasters so people early adopters say got burned in all kinds of ways. And if you wanted to buy Bitcoin, say, uh, as an asset class through your financial advisor, they would throw their hands up and say, sorry, we're not allowed to because these regulations are not in place. So along comes the, uh, the news uh, from last week, which basically um, through a series of regulatory steps, the SEC says, okay, uh, you, you funds who have filed uh, appropriate petitions can now buy and trade Bitcoin. And so the theory is that a whole bunch of money is about to flow into Bitcoin because it's now possible. My view, my take on all that uh, from the bullish perspective, because I think I am philosophically, not think, I know I am philosophically in the bullish camp about Bitcoin. I see this as a moment in which more people, because they have access to Bitcoin, more ways to get it, will actually get it. And over time, over years, the 
the what's called I guess the Bitcoin network the story about Bitcoin will actually go further and more people will become comfortable buying it the amount of money stored in it will increase therefore in a sense stabilizing prices because up to now it's kind of like sort of a niche thing I mean relatively speaking gold is a asset class of what 13 trillion Bitcoin is now uh, about 900 billion so relatively speaking that's a one in 14 you know it's Bitcoin still has a long way to go but as the I guess I guess the the optimistic way of what I'm trying to say is as more people have access to it through these additional more legitimized sources the more people will believe in it the more it will infiltrate culture in general stop being so niche therefore stabilizing the price and all these other use cases will start being built on it and it, I kind of see it as yeah gold's days are numbered uh, so that's uh, I think the cheery perspective uh, vulture mr. not advice you don't quite see things that way as far as I'm I could tell no I, I think that um, this euphoria from some of the some Bitcoin fanatics that now we have uh, we can use the ETF uh, openings as a sign of a broader acceptance by uh, society as a, another function. Bitcoin is another function method to exchange, uh, you know, payment for goods and services is going to end up being, um, I, I think it's going to end up, they're going to look back and say, well, that wasn't such a great thing because what they've allowed to do is they've allowed the fox in the in the hen house, so to speak. So one of the things that Bitcoin that was that it's attractive was it, it traded within a closed environment, meaning that uh, you pretty much had purists buying Bitcoin. Um, you had people who believed in the technology or bought it for an investment. Uh, but the amount of capital that could flow through that market, as you said, um, you know, it's only it's less than a trillion dollar market. So it was a, it's a small market. Now with the ETFs, what you just invited in is uh, I'll just use the top one, BlackRock. You know, BlackRock is um, has their hands in. Uh, I think I saw a number that they own. They have controlling positions uh, in 25 percent of the top corporations in America through their their stock ownership. Now you've got them in Bitcoin and on Tuesday, uh, I believe, let's see, Tuesday or Wednesday of this week, we're going to have Bitcoin futures start trading. So what I'm seeing is the pieces are being put into place for uh, Bitcoin to now start being manipulated. Um, we've got futures market open. I did see when I logged into my Thinkorswim, uh, I had to check off on a new disclaimer that said um, that I understood the risk of um, uh, inverse and 2x and 3x Bitcoin uh, future ETPs. So <clears throat> once they put into place a inverse or a 2x or a 3x, they're exactly the same tools that were used, that are being used to um, manipulate the VIX down. And I think they're going to do the same thing to Bitcoin. In fact, when Bitcoin was, this was announced, the, the ETFs, Bitcoin was trading almost at 47,000. Uh, I made a comment to members and put it out there that I thought that we'd see at least a 10% drop. Here we are two days later and Bitcoin is at 42, a little above 42,000. I think we could go as low as 39,000. And the reason is... Um, I've seen this before on new issues. I think that we've got larger players now um, are driving the price down. I think the ETF companies, um, BlackRock at the top, and I think they want Bitcoin lower so they can what I call sandbag, which is lock in some cheap uh, positive returns by buying it lower artificially. And then I think 
Bitcoin will continue its march upwards. Structurally, you know, for Bitcoin with the halving coming up, and now you have additional demand dollars going to be flowing into the asset. I think Bitcoin goes much higher from where it is now, but not until this manipulation period is over. Badger, when you hear uh, Vulture talk about <clears throat> manipulation like that, how's that strike you? Or do, do you know what that means? Do, do you know? Um, it'd, be, it'd be interesting, actually, if you could bring it to life with a specific example of how the market gets manipulated and then if i were if i were holding actual currency maybe self-custody in a wallet you know what does that mean to me if i'm a you know a long time bitcoin advocate sure <clears throat> so um we'll, we'll use the futures market because we know that that product's approved uh, bitcoin futures and we'll be start trading on the cboe this week so what could happen is what's called an arbitrage so you could sell short um, Bitcoin futures. <clears throat> Bitcoin future is, <clears throat> you know, my best, uh, my my uh, simplest explanation. It's like an option contract on steroids. It's much larger, uh, the notional value, and it's a much bigger market. And so, <clears throat> what you could do is sell short Bitcoin futures, um, and on a let's say a Saturday, okay when the ETF market's closed and you could gap it, gap the ETFs down for the Monday open, meaning that the underlying value is now lower because the futures market has been used to drive it lower. You have the ETF will open up at a discount. So right off the bat, we've got price direction that is not naturally occurring. It's only occurring because of the futures market. Um, you could step in and buy the ETF, or I'm sorry, wait for the ETF to drop um, to get in parity with the futures market. Uh, you then stop the pressure in the futures market and voila, you've got uh, Bitcoin moving back up uh, as a snapback response to the futures market and you just made money in the ETF. That's one way. Um, the other way is when they, they start spitting out these two times and three times ETFs and inverse ETFs, they only have one purpose. Um, last year, before the Silicon Valley Bank uh, collapsed, uh, there were, uh, I believe, three, two inverse um, uh, VIX ETFs. Um, Silicon Valley collapses three weeks beforehand. They announced three more of those types of ETFs. Uh, because it's another method to be able to create an arbitrage where the underlying value can be manipulated without the actual trade occurring in the asset. And so Bitcoin, the beauty about Bitcoin has been such a clean market. You bought Bitcoin, you sold Bitcoin. There was very little, uh, there wasn't anything on the outside, an outside force that was going to affect the price. Now you've got one coming this week in the futures market, and then eventually you're going to have these ETFs. And so, and and an important note is, you know, the Bitcoin market is about to, is going to deal with a size of a participant that they've never had to before. You're talking about trillions of dollars being managed by these ETF companies that are doing Bitcoin. Um, that is an entirely different type of market participant than Bitcoin holders have been used to at this point. They're not in it for the functionality. They're not in it because they believe in Bitcoin. They are in it to make money. It's another simple asset and they, they're gonna manipulate it um, because they have the tools. You don't do those tools unless you plan on manipulating the product, is my point. And, and this has happened sort of time and time again in different commodity markets. We talked about gold earlier in the call. Like, has this happened with gold as well? Yeah, um, you know, gold's an interesting one because it's uh, such a concentrated issue for central banks. And so, you know, I like to say that gold is subject to manipulation by central banks. So I'm talking about more of the retail manipulation. I think that people are going to, or, or Bitcoin truists and purists are going to be surprised and it's going to infuriate them to see Bitcoin prices moving up and down uh, in a way that they're not familiar with. I mean, they're, they're, 
simply the futures market, opening the door up to trillion dollar players, um, <clears throat> it's going to be a different type of trading regimen for Bitcoin. But ultimately, the functionality and, and the having, it's a supply and demand issue, will drive it up, I think. But not before we get done with this little downdraft. This is all artificially con created. I, I mean, what happened since the announcement that would cause Bitcoin to be down 10%? What fundamentally changed about the Bitcoin story? Um, has the functionality been lost? No. Has the acceptance rate, uh, has it been made illegal? No. Uh, I, I mean, why is it although, down 10%? I mean, although, um, isn't, I mean, I, I, th I understand everything you're saying, but I think I immediately think, well, what, when's that not the case? Like, I mean, <laughs> in the history of Bitcoin, it's had so many massive drops seemingly you know i mean somebody's buying a lot or selling a lot uh you know for no reason obviously because it's in theory a store of value so in in theory the bitcoin line should kind of be relatively flat ish and and also in the stock market too i mean sometimes you know the the price of a stock moves tremendously one way or another without any news so how do you differentiate i guess what you're calling manipulation versus uh let's say a big moneyed player just chooses to sell let's say because it's in their best interest to sell and therefore the price falls i think it has to do with the st the type of investor like i said it was a it was a closed environment before and you know yeah you have a couple of whales involved in the bitcoin market but the majority of bitcoin i i think is is at least pre, um, let's call it third quarter 2023, was not held by huge institutional players. I mean, you had Greystone there um, with their Bitcoin trust, but I think the, the the speed at which things move, you know, Bitcoin to me was one of the last structurally free trading markets, okay? It, it, it traded, yes, there were spikes, yes, there were drops, um, but ultimately, Bitcoin did not have the direct and visible hand of manipulation in it. And so usually, you, you know, now that we have these additional financial instruments available that are hypothecated against Bitcoin, okay, uh, I think what we're going to see is uh, a level of manipulation that the price will go over short-term periods now, okay? the price will go over short-term periods where the large players want it to go. And I think that's going to be, that's what's new in the Bitcoin market. I also think that, you know, you've got for this, there's estimates anywhere between 5 billion all the way up. Standard Charter um, was one of the oldest banks in the world. And they put out a research note last week that they saw between 50 billion and a hundred billion dollars flowing into Bitcoin via these ETFs. And, <clears throat> When you have, you got to remember that the issuers of the ETFs, the way they make their money, um, they, they are agnostic as to which way the direction of Bitcoin goes. They don't care. They just need it to move. Whereas an investor cares. They, they want it to go up. Whereas now BlackRock and the other companies have the ability to lend against those ETF shares. They can hypothecate them further which then generates additional borrowed capital to go manipulate Bitcoin. Um, the door has been opened and, and I don't know what it's going to look like, but I've seen this in the, in, you know, let's look at the ODTE market. You know, prior, prior to zero DTEs being released, which are now what, 70% of the volume? And by um, the way, listeners, zero DTEs mean zero days till expiration for options contracts. Yeah, when, before those lottery tickets were released to be traded, okay, we had less volatility in the market um, on an intraday basis with zero DTEs being introduced, which again are primarily used by retail that doesn't know what they're doing and or gambling and institutions. And so, so if you continue to give institutions and large players the methodology to move the price of an asset for their benefit, they're going to do it. And that's why I start off by saying they just invited the fox into the hen house. 
Um, so, that's not even to speak about future functionality degradations of Bitcoin, because now you have record keeping involved. Um, and finally, people buying the ETF, they don't own Bitcoin. They, they don't own directly Bitcoin. There's, there's the other thing that people think, well, I'm buying the ETF, so I own Bitcoin. No, you don't. You own part of what BlackRock owns. But the name on the address for the ownership of the Bitcoin is not yours. This is not a mutual fund. So, um, but yes, sorry. The, and I'm, 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 not a, I'm neither an advocate or a detractor for Bitcoin. I'm kind of neutral on this topic. I wonder, though, whether it's just ine inevitable that anything like this has to go through a phase of being regulated, being accepted by the broader financial system, and then, as, as you characterize, Mr. Not Advice, being subject to potential manipulation by big market players. But maybe it's, you know, maybe it's unavoidable. And I don't know whether this is long term good or bad. You know, Christoph, you highlighted some good points for Bitcoin, the sort of broader acceptance, understanding the safety, if you do want to sort of tie some of your assets to Bitcoin as an asset class, even if you don't own the coins directly, um, you know, maybe that's long term beneficial or maybe you're giving up value because now these big market players are able to extract it, um, you know, as, as and when they see fit. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll say I'll say one more thing about this. Uh, Mr. Not Advice is right about the ownership problem because the whole principle behind Bitcoin is you are seeking an alternative to a problematic money system. But in the days before the ETF, uh, if you did not actually do the proper work to own your Bitcoin on your own hard wallet address like I, I do, because that does require a little bit of technological savvy or know-how, then you were trusting these other exchanges, which we found out were mostly corrupt because human nature right i mean you i mean to, something that's too good to be true uh was too good to be true and so people were burned massively i wonder if when a gigantic financial institution like blackrock now gets in the game even though their own let's say intentions are borderline either neutral or sometimes you know obviously self-interested in maybe unsavory from the perspective of they don't care about Bitcoin itself. They just want to make money. But is it the case that they are so big, the whole too big to fail thing, that that if you invest Bitcoin with them, even though you don't own it, at the very least, you could pretty much be sure that they're not going to turn out to be, let's say, corrupt in the way these previous crypto exchanges were literally corrupt. Mr. Not Advice, is that a naive way of thinking of it? No, I, 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 I think I would agree with you to the extent, though, that the exchange, you know, the exchange, Bitcoin exchanges and the fact that they were corrupt had more to do with what they were, how they were lending. Um, you know, if we use Sam Bank Bankman Freed as an example, right, uh, it, it was how he was, um, what's the right word? His exchange, it, you know, look, I'm not a tinfoil hack guy, but I believe it has been within the world government's um, goal to find a way to gain access to the Bitcoin market, to find a way for what you just said, you know, yours is on your own, you know, cold storage wallet. Um, that's anonymous. That's, the, you know, the governments don't like when people transact business and they don't know about it. And, uh, you know, I think, and I'm, I'm fairly well versed on the structure of Bitcoin and functionality. You know, quite frankly, Bitcoin to me is sort of like, uh, you know, uh, the Dow 30, right? It's, it's, it's what everyone knows, but it's not from a functionality standpoint. We don't have to get into this discussion, but it's not the digital currency that has the functionality. It's the later ones that are coming, um, or the later, the ones that were issued in digital currency that have specific functionalities, right? And so I think by allowing these large players and, you know, and the fact that there's not a direct true ownership of Bitcoin, 
Um, they've Bitcoin has done what they've been against. They, they've pegged it to a fiat currency, but making it worse, they've pegged it to a fiat currency that can be hypothecated. The whole thing behind Bitcoin was it couldn't be hypothecated. You couldn't borrow against or you couldn't you couldn't leverage Bitcoin. That's one of the problems of fiat currency, right? Is you increase the value with uh, of the, the paper value of the currency without having a real asset behind it also increasing. Um, so you, you, you can marginally affect supply and demand that way. And so, you know, this is the first step, I think, with Bitcoin where it, it was interesting to me. They, you know, everyone's celebrating it as an acceptance by the general public. Well, I can tell you the general public doesn't generally, the same people who didn't care about Bitcoin last Wednesday, they don't care about Bitcoin today. Um, it's an ETF. It's being marketed as an ETF. You know, so we're not gaining new acolytes to the Bitcoin, you know, religion by these ETFs. Um, all we've done is allow a company like BlackRock to come in uh, and, and they're also helping JP Morgan and BlackRock are also involved with the exchange side of it, the clearing side of Bitcoin. This this is look at the end of the day, Bitcoin's market was pure and untouched. They just let. I mean, they, they just let the single largest manipulator of assets, BlackRock, now in the game. And so, look, long term, I think Bitcoin's going up, supply and demand. But it's only going to go up for as long as it can retain the value of being not associated with the current financial system. Well, you just invited in, you know, <laughs> one of the largest players of the current financial system. The only, yeah. the only, I will say this, the only provider that I know believes in the functionality is, is Kathy Woods, ARC. It's not a recommendation, but at least I know she, in her ETF, she believes in the functionality of Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, ARC to me is one of the better players. And then finally, I'm trying to figure out which one of them is going to get hacked first. That's why I've been running through the prospectuses and finding what their security is. You know, they may have cold storage as they held off site. How do they do this? Because one of them is going to get hacked. It's inevitable. <laughs> so, I mean, what a juicy target for, for out there. So I'm just trying to figure out which one's going to get hacked first and how do I short them? So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, banks of banks hold gold reserves and, you know, they do hold physical assets, but it's a little bit different having like their secure version of a cold wallet where they've got their currency. Um, yeah, yeah, much more open to uh, to cybercrime. Well, you know, well, with banks and gold, though, there was that one uh, provider, uh, and they had I had watched them shorten or lengthen their audit times on the physical gold, and so you know, it's important for people I think to read beyond the headline and really, really understand what they're buying. You know, I, I think there's going to be, they're going to market this like, well, they already are, market this like, join the digital age and join the digital currencies. Well, you're not. <laughs> so you're, you're not doing that. You're buying a trading vehicle. Well, as though uh, that wasn't gloomy enough in a sense, <laughs> do you want to pivot to uh, the doomsday scenarios? Sure. Okay. I, uh, and, and just to, just to help intro this as well, like you you have a fascinating list of seven dooms, seven ways in which it, you've positioned it as the ways in which the market might sell off. A couple of these are the ways in which the world might literally end. So, like put on your put on your raincoats and your uh, nuclear radiation shelters before you listen to this next segment. <laughs> and for the record, just uh, to keep Badger honest here, in his own uh, New Year's, uh, pre our prediction show, so go back to whatever episode that was, I believe Badger himself was talking about how things potentially might go really, really wrong for humanity, which obviously ends in tragic consequences. But you're the one who, who brought the nukes into, into <laughs> this. Anyway. So Mr. Not Advice is not the only one. But anyway, so if you, uh, if you are not following Mr. Not Advice, check out his Twitter. He's at Mr. Not Advice. And his uh, website is also called Mr. Not Therein you will find 
an archive of his newsletters, which he publishes once a week, Saturday or Sunday, uh, full of chock, chock full of all kinds of market insights, many of which at this moment in time have this doomsday-ish quality. And so Mr. Not Advice two weeks, two, I believe it was two weeks ago, published a succinct, uh, I guess it's a list or summary of seven dooms doomsday-like scenarios that if they occur, if they were to occur, the market would go down by however many percentage points. And I thought we would start at the top, which I believe Mr. Nutt advice is according to probability. Uh, number one being that commercial real estate implodes. Can you uh, walk us through your thinking in, in hopefully the simplest terms you can? Sure. So as a result of 2008, uh, liquidity went into the financial uh, sector. And what that means is the federal government started printing dollars. Uh, they just printed them out of the air and they pushed them out to banks. The banks were supposed to use those dollars to lend to small businesses. They didn't. Uh, and they put that into risk assets. And one of the risk assets that they went into was commercial real estate because it was assumed pre-COVID that the economy was growing and there would be much more use for, uh, you know, the economy is expanding. So office space, uh, commercial real estate um, was expanding with it, but they were doing it with cheap money, meaning that the interest rates which they were getting loans for were artificially low. Now we have a sort of perfect storm, which is you have declining commercial real estate values due, due to primarily rising vacancy rates, okay? Why? Because COVID work at home um, uh, occurred and 50% and of the workers have not returned to the office. And it does not appear that corporations are going to demand 100% return. So you, you now have a built-in uh, lower vacancy factor. Um, you've got, which causes real estate prices to decline, right? I mean, if you're at 90% occupancy and now you're at 80% or 60%, um, you're collecting less rent dollars, so you have less money to cover the debt, right? And all your bills, so that's happening. So at some point, what will happen uh, is all the banks, and, and, and it really went down to the regionals, okay? They needed a way to find, to make money, and so they flooded into commercial real estate, and loans were given uh, based on credit pictures that perhaps shouldn't have been given. Same thing that happened for the home building and the home buying before 2008. So now we have declining asset value. We've got loans. Uh, I think we've got um, in 2024, almost a trillion dollars worth of CRE loans are going to be renewed. And you got to remember, those loans were done in three and four percent. Now they're going to have to come due in eight or nine percent. And so that's a 500, 600 basis point change in their debt cost. They have declined, they have increasing vacancy. So I believe what's, what will happen, and we're already seeing it, is that owners of buildings will walk away and throw the keys to the bank. They won't try to work anything out. They'll just take the loss and move on. And, and we're already seeing this. We're, we're already seeing, well, there was a property in LA that two years ago sold for 145 million. It just sold for 40 million. And so th these are huge asset value reductions. Um, once the first one to two banks fail, um, I think that will start the dominoes and we're going to start seeing major failures across the CRE space. Uh, Mr. that's Nutt, my CRE time, doom. Okay. Yeah. That, uh, can you, uh, give us an example of the kind of bank that might fail? So I know obviously a bank like Silicon Valley Bank, as far as I could tell, that was somewhat out of the blue. It was. One, right? I mean, that's one of the problems with banks is uh, they're black boxes, right? They're not, they can't tell you exactly what's, what's on their balance sheets or how, right? I mean, I don't know if that's accurate or not. No, that's accurate. They, 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 they don't have to by law. The, I mean, remember the regulations and the laws are not set up to protect the common person. The banks don't have to realize their losses. Uh, the, the, you know, the, they are, have been given the ability and they use it. Bank of America is a perfect example. Bank of America just reported 
uh, earnings, and yet they only reported, I think, a $42 million increase for charge-offs. So, you know, they're, they're playing the pretend game, too, which is we don't have any bad loans. Um, you know, we're, we're fine. We know they have bad loans. And banks don't have to realize those until uh, one of two things happens. There's a sale of the property, okay, or the owner walks away. And so it's, they're actually given the ability to hide uh, these deteriorating value assets. They did it in 2008, okay, and they're doing it again. But this time, the commercial real estate market is many times larger than the residential market. And so I, I uh, you know, to me, that is inevitable. CRE is imploding, and it's just a function of which bank goes first. I think it's gonna be a regional bank. So it's not gonna be a major like a Bank of America or Wells Fargo, they'll be down the road. Uh, and I think the CRE implosion is gonna take, it's gonna go into 2025. You know, bad actors, look, no different than somebody who's holding a stock that's down, okay? Human nature is to ignore it. Human nature is not to deal with it. And the regula regulatory agencies have set it up such that banks don't have to deal with it. And worse, what they can do is they can go to the federal government, just borrow money. And that's what they've been doing. They've been borrowing money through a program that allows, uh, is for emergency. And banks have been really tapping that. And that's, that's when banks don't have, when you see banks tapping that, it's, it's one of two reasons, either trying to meet need, meaning uh, withdrawal need, or they've got balance sheet issues. And so I think they have balance sheet issues. Um, I suppose post 2008, like the banks were required to reinforce their balance sheets, hold much more sort of tier one, tier two capital. That was supposed to avoid a recurrence. But your position here is this is such a big problem with commercial real estate. The measures that were taken were insufficient. Yeah, but but you know, and, and think about this. You're you're absolutely correct. They they were uh, required to hold more in reserve, but at the same time, Treasury made a rule change which uh, allowed s banks, um, first of all, what they classified as reserves, but more importantly, uh, they were the banks now actually for periods of time are able to to hold very little reserves. Uh, depending upon what the portfolio makeup is of, of their, their balance sheet. I mean, you, you know, it's, it's, it's that old adage, that, you know, what the left hand is doing, watch what the right hand is doing too. So you've got banks in the situation where they, they have gorged off of a decade and a half of cheap, easy money, and they lent it out. Because remember, they make money on the transaction, okay? They make the origination fee. So they go out and they do a loan and they're making a 1%, a half a percent origination fee and let's say a $100 million loan or uh, you know, a $500 million loan, that's where they're making their money. Um, they, they, they're not thinking of the risk side of it, of, of how long this, comp this, this you know, are they gonna get the principal back? They've never had to worry about that. Uh, now they're having to worry about it, so. So you know, as I listen to this, because this, this is domino number one, on your uh, doomsday chart, Mr. Not Advice, I think it's worth spending a little more time and detail on this, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, because it seems like potentially from your perspective too, this is the, uh, what's it called? The uh, keg powder, right? That could ignite everything else. Yes. What's in, in, in Badger, I mean, we, you've been investing, you had been an investor too in the 2008 era. I, I personally was still a graduate student, so the amount of money that I lost uh, was, relatively speaking, low. Uh, but many people who were retirement age around 2007, 2008, 2009, I mean, they lost massive amounts of money. It was absolutely devastating. And I think the shocking part from memory, I'm speaking from that experiential memory position, was some fuckers out there knew Right, the people on the inside knew how bad things were, but of course, publicly, neither they nor the federal agencies could say anything. All they could say was everything's fine because to not say that causes the self-fulfilling prophecy of bank runs, right? 
So having that experience in my back pocket, I'm wondering, I'm listening to Mr. Not Advice thinking, okay, is this 2008 again? And if so, why? How could it be that this is occurring yet again? Uh, is it human nature to be just incapable of regulating itself out of you know greed and it's just an endless cycle of, yeah, a, a greed cycle? Or and this is what I'm hoping there's some cheerier outcome, is there a scenario where this does not come to pass? Where, in, in other words, the doomsday way of thinking about this proves, uh, it's not that it's wrong theoretically, yeah, that it's right theoretically, but somehow that it's not how it plays out. And there's, um, you know, one of the learnings from 2008 was that there are certain institutions, certain big global banks that were like, I think they're flagged as globa globally systemically important banks. Like they're the ones that are truly too big to fail. And so if you were a GSIB, um, like my ex-employer, then you had a much higher level of regulation applied to you and how you manage your um, risk, essentially. Um, but, but here we're talking about like smaller banks that don't fit into that category. And... Like, so what, so a kind of a naive question, perhaps, Mr. Not Advice, like, in some ways, we know, we know this may or may not affect the banks that are truly too big to fail, but it could wipe out a lot of the smaller regional banks. Like, what would actually, what actually happens? Why would, naive question, like, why would I care if I'm oh, okay. just like a regular worker in North America? Yeah, I, I think beyond the whole moral hazard issue of it's just not right for parties to be you know, systematically passing along risk to taxpayers, because if you got it, you, there's two things that, that, that call, you know, that 2008 that were supposed to be fixed and weren't. Number one, what was supposed to be fixed was the, the banks were going to stop taking that money and putting in the risk assets and they were going to loan it out into the economy. They didn't do that. Number two, derivatives. They, they were supposed to fix the derivatives issue. They did not fix it. Derivatives still exist. They didn't make them illegal. They call them by a different name now. But, it, you know, for the simplest way to look at this, when you invest in gold, you buy a piece of or a, 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 some size of the bullion itself, okay? Whereas what happens when large financial players get involved, they start hypothecating. They start loaning against that. They start multiplying the value um, so they can borrow against it. These are things that are all part of a system that is broken. Um, and so f down on the ground for you, okay, you may have a limit on your cash withdrawal. We've seen that already happen in the UK and Australia. Uh, Australia. Um, you may be limited to $500 a week. You may, you may simply not be able to do it. Um, that, that would be a, a, a bank run. What's interesting is if you follow this down the road, look, if I'm a JP Morgan and I want to expand my business, there's one cheap way to do that. And that's to buy a bank or to rescue a bank out of FDIC, right? Banks failed. I go in and I'm the white knight as JP Morgan and I take all those good deposits. But what happens to all the toxic, toxic debt? Well, in a bailout, that gets transferred to the treasury. So you're able to go in as a JP Morgan, take over the deposit base and the good business of a bank and offload all the toxic, toxic crap that that bank has because the treasury will take that on their balance sheet. And so now we had a transfer of bad behavior, taking on bad loans to the taxpayer and the JP Morgans of the world, they get to get the best part of that bank. And I think the other thing will happen is Consumers are going to have a lot less chance for bank or lot less choices for banking. So, and and the reason the, to make it really simple, like the reason this is a big concern is ultimately it's consumers' money. Like consumers lent their money to the bank. The banks lent their money to buy these risk assets. They've blown up. It's not that you could say, okay, well screw it, let's let the bank and the bank shareholders fail. It's right. worse than that because it's people who've made deposits with those banks. Right. I don't think, uh, you know, FDIC insurance, I think, is somewhere like 40 cents on every dollar. Right. 
So, oh no, it's even worse. That's SIPC. It's very, very low, meaning if you have $100 in a bank, you know, and the bank goes upside down, legally, the, the amount the FDIC covers you is somewhere in the, you know, I, I haven't checked, maybe in a 20 cent range. So, people's, it's a fallacy to think that, well, FDIC will get all my money back. Yes, you most likely will, as long as there's only a certain small sample of banks that have failed. I, I actually, unfortunately, think that this could be. If, if, if the CRE market collapsed to the point where derivatives on, their, on their, their balance sheets had to be recognized, losses or gains, that is what accelerates it into a very bad situation for our economy. Um, I don't know if that will happen yet. It, 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 you know, that's free market, but... Uh, well, let's actually touch on that a little bit uh, and just put a rough maybe somewhat arbitrary number let's say the doomsday scenario let's say this uh commercial real estate does implode and regional banks do go under the stock market goes down by how many percentage points do you think in the 20 to 40 20 to 40 percent so major so like a major yeah that would be a major major downturn oh yes yeah none of the uh Everything on my doom list is at least a 10% down trigger. And, how, and I suppose the key question is, and I don't know if there's an easy answer to this. Like if I'm a, maybe I'm not even a shareholder or an investor. I'm just like a working guy who has money in the bank. Like, how do I protect myself from this? Oh, I think uh, having money, look, the banking system in the U.S. is broken. Um, it used to be you could, you could hide out in credit unions, right? Uh, credit unions are their own organization. They're not subject to, I mean, they're subject to federal regulation, but they, they sort of operate in their own community. Uh, but credit unions have also taken on commercial real estate loans. You know, you got to remember banks, traditional business are lending, right? To, for houses and small businesses and cars and deposits. Banks never did until the removal of the Glass-Steagall. Um, they never did risk asset investing, and there was a reason why they are prohibited from doing it, because it creates the wrong mentality. A bank's job is to protect money, not to risk it. And so when that door, that door was open, banks flooded in. But I think if you're a consumer looking at a bank, I, I, you know, the very easy thing, have more than one. You know, uh, you know I, I personally have always, at all times, cash, you know, in, in my possession of at least a one month of expenses. Um, so as a consumer, it's setting up for, you know, if the bank were to have a difficulty and you couldn't get your money for a couple of weeks, even, even Silicon Valley Bank, even though, even though they were all made whole, they still had days, I think it was maybe a week and a half where they didn't have access to their money. Okay, they're, they're just a common banking customer. And so having your account at two different, at least two, uh, I think is smart. And also making a, di a differentiation between the type of bank. You know, having your account at a major, you, you know, uh, uh, Wells Fargo or your U.S. bank, fine. But have some at a small local bank, you know, that, that maybe only has branches uh, within your state, you know, uh, banks that do not go outside of the state are not regulated directly by uh, Treasury. They are regulated by the state banking examiner. And states tend to be more strict than the federal government for banking. So certainly finding a small bank, too, I think would be it would be wise. Good advice. I don't know if this is also counter counterproductive or counter what we were talking about earlier in Bitcoin, but I would, I'll go on the record to say, you know what, whatever, you know, however you divide your assets at this point in time, having 0% in Bitcoin is increasing your risk because of the systemic issues. So if you're really thinking from both uh, the perspective of an investor and trying to keep yourself safe, if the banking system does start rumbling, then I believe, I mean, I could be wrong. I could be very wrong, but I believe that we will begin seeing uh, Bitcoin hold up, meaning demonstrate uh, in the real world the reason it was invented was, was as an alternative to that system. So I don't know, there's no correct percentage, but 
between one and I don't know, 10% of your assets in Bitcoin as a store of value doesn't seem stupid. <laughs> They're not 10%. <laughs> okay. Wait, can I follow that up with with the second part of the question, Mr. Not Advice, which is, can I put you on the spot to offer us your most sunshine, puppies and rainbows view for commercial real estate surviving and not imploding? Yeah. Slash uh, commercial, sorry, commercial real estate slash regional banks. Yeah. As, as a combination. It would be uh, a level of the mother of all stimulus packages. That's what saves banks uh, is the mother of all stimulus packages coming out. Um, and what does I, that mean? What well, does that I think mean? that's the federal government engaging in a program where they're they're offering, um, again, cheap money to be borrowed. Uh, what the banks are supposed to do with that money is to shore up their balance sheets and make conservative loans, and they won't. But that's what what they're they'll say they're going to do, uh, and that's the only thing that pushes down the road for some time. Uh, banks being uh, collapsing. Uh, not all banks. Look, it's it's. I'm not talking about a. You don't need you know 90% of banks to collapse to cause. Uh, you know, significant issues within the, within the economy. The whole banking system is built upon perceived trust, right? Perceived safety. So you only need a couple to really to shake up uh, the confidence in that system. So, but you know, all my doomsday bets in terms of how it'll affect the market will be substantially reduced if they do another round of quantitative easing which would be mass, it would need to be massive. And if they do that, then we're gonna trigger hyperinflation. They're just kicking the can and it's gonna make it exponentially worse for the average citizen in America and, and the world. It's just gonna be worse. And I think as you said in your newsletter though, that's probably the more likely outcome just because this is an election year. Yes, yeah, I, I think that we're gonna get stimulus. I think right now what they're trying to do is they're, the, the, they're trying to, make sure the market doesn't fall. And we've discussed this on how they do that. They're trying to make sure the market doesn't fall because, you know, if bank stocks fall 10%, that's that's a 10% hit on their capitalization, right? And so, you know, banks have a debt to equity. They, they've got all these different ratios they have to abide by. I, I would say that there are banks right now in violation, but again, it's not be, it ha doesn't have to be reported yet uh, because they don't have to realize their losses. But I... I I think that a bailout's going to inflate just like it did after 2008 and 2021. Uh, you'll probably be able to hold your nose, buy anything in the market, and it'll go up because of, because of a bailout, because of all that cheap money come from the Treasury, which they're printing out of thin air, which is inflationary. Um, but, you know, human nature is not to think about the future. They live in the present, and as long as they're happy for that moment, they're going to ignore what's coming down the road and what, what the current situation is creating. This is bad. But, yeah. So, I mean, we, it, it, uh, this is maybe starting to uh, inquire a little bit about the next doomsday dominoes because out of context, uh, a stimulus obviously has, there's, a, there's room for rational emergency stimulus yes but i think what i'm what i'm sensing is okay we've lived through 2008 where that required massive stimulus then there is the so additional money is added to the system uh in the sense unexpectedly then you have the intervening 14 years now where the rules and regulations that ought to have been put in place were not then you have the emergency of covid which adds another massive wave of unexpected emergency money, right? And if now the only thing to save the current real estate slash regional bank crisis is another wave of massive stimulus, then it seems to me, unless I'm misunderstanding, at some point, mathematically speaking, that the rate at which money is being printed is so high or so outside the norm that to contain it, the in other words, to contain the inflation, 
will require interest rates to go way, way higher than we've been used to since, I don't know, the 70s? Is that, I mean, it, is that kind of the rock and the hard place that we're in? Yeah, I, I, well, I, I think what makes it even more worse, what makes it worse is that we already have a roadmap to know what the banks are going to do. Look, it wasn't just UBS and, and, and U.S. Bank and Wells Fargo taking stimulus money and not using it for what they said they were going to use it for. If, if that money had been used to stimulate the economy, we wouldn't be where we're at today economically. But it wasn't used for that. So I have no confidence that the next round of stimulus will be used correctly to stimulate the economy. Is it a never-ending inflationary spiral? Um, yeah. We're already in a never-ending inflationary spiral. All we have to look at is a CPI since back in 1940, and it's a straight line up. So, you know, people say, well, there's also always a natural inflator in life. And, and no, no, there's not. There's actually not a natural inflator. People pay more prices because they're told to pay more prices. And so there's this belief that, well, I'm, you know, I'm always going to have some level of inflation. Well, you know, it, it, is, it is true that over the course of time, but what, you have, what you're going to have is not naturally occurring inflation. It's, it's look, you can't, you can't do, you, you can't print trillions of dollars in stimulus and it not be inflationary. And that's what the Fed's trying to do. They're trying to pull that money out of the market, but the market, that liquidity, the market doesn't like that. So it's sort of like a game of chicken. But I mean, for the average person, what could, what could be the end game of this? Well, now you're going to have to put your tinfoil hat on, but I believe where we're headed is a pseudo nationalization of banks. I think that a nationalization of banks, and it will be within the hands of the JP Morgans and the U.S. banks, and they'll, they'll assimilate some of these smaller banks. But, you know, what did we have? We've already had, uh, I forget how many thousands of branch closings last year. Didn't make news. It was quiet. But we've had a shrinking within the banking system of access for the average consumer. Um, I don't know when that will happen. But I think we're headed towards more of a nationalized, this nationalization of bank. Um, and I think that's the ultimate goal is to put, to, to reduce the number of lenders, of uh, bankers for the public to use. So they have to be forced into these large money center banks. Um, and, and if you follow the bread trails, that's what's been happening. So, Mr. Not Advice, I don't know if you know, but Badger and yours truly, uh, Humble Monkey, have a uh, portfolio contest oh. that we started at the beginning of November, where we each make selections, mm -hmm. uh, hoping to outperform the other for very high stakes, <laughs> Name, namely a dinner uh, delivered by the other dressed in uh, an animal costume. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and... Uh, and because I, I tend to frequent your parts, uh, I bought some puts in KRE, symbol KRE, which is an uh, ETF comprised of some of these regional banks. Now, what I'm asking you, Mr. Not Advice, is since you're partly to blame for my, <laughs> my choice to invest in this particular asset class, the date, by the way, I have two. Uh, one is dated September of 24, and then I bought a new one dated as a leap uh, the, January of 25. Do you think that the KRE puts that I bought will work in my favor against Badger, or will I have egg on my face because uh, the, the banks did not fail in the time frame that I thought they might fail? I don't know what Badger uh, as his choice was, but my large position and the one that I hold the most confidence in is shorting KRE. Uh, I think that the bank failures, we, we, uh, I think they're going to happen towards the end of the first quarter, beginning in, in somewhere in the second quarter. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think that your puts. I think KRE is going to be significantly lower at the end of this year than it is today. 
and if the right slash wrong things happen, um, you could see a, a a measured collapse within the regional banking system. But is that within uh, within what you said about the the higher probability of there being a stimulus? Well, the stimulus, I don't know. You know, we're in election year. I don't know if there's a political will to do a stimulus program. That's why I think the banks are engaging in this kick the can down the road uh, for as many quarters as they can do it. Uh, it's not going to be a Wells Fargo. It's going to be some bank you've never heard of that all of a sudden pops up on your news feed and they say, uh, we're having problems. We're going to the FDIC. I don't, I don't, you know, stimulus... I don't know if there's a political appetite for stimulus to occur in this year. Um, and certainly I don't think the timing's right for, it's not bad enough yet for that stimulus. Um, so I don't think in an election year we're gonna see, I think the American public would just go ape shit if you know, the, the current administration were to announce a huge bailout for, for banks. Um, but I don't think that's how it's gonna be sold. Uh, I think it's how it's going to be sold as this. The, f the first round, we, we had to do 2008 bailouts for these huge, huge you know, banks. These are for your banks. These are the local banks we're helping, the regionals and the small banks. I think that's how they get it sold. Um, I think that's when AmeriPub goes, oh, okay, yeah, you're helping my bank, not the evil Wells Fargo or a U.S. bank. And so I think that's where the stimulus occurs within the banking system. The other thing is I think it's not going to be it's not going to be publicized. It's going to be this, through some bank lending program that the Treasury puts together, too. But I think your KRE puts, I think you're going to be very happy with them. Uh, you know, you hear that, Badger? Because <laughs> right now, Badger's whooping my ass, unfortunately, because my <laughs> KRE puts have uh, fallen, uh, I think, 80% uh, from when I bought them in late October. But oh. but Badger, let, just, just don't, don't look so happy over there. Uh, well, what is Badger own? I, I, I've just bought some high quality companies that I think are going to do well come hell or high water. One of which is, let's say, CrowdStrike, hopefully protecting some of the banks from uh, yeah. losing their Bitcoin inadvertently. But yeah. we should come on to some of your other dooms, though, Mr. Not Advice, because a couple sure. of them, hopefully they're lower probability, but a couple of them, if they play out, then everything we talked about so far is basically irrelevant. Uh, becomes worse. Yeah. These are the, yeah. My do, my doom list is not individual. My doom list is if if anything's hap these things happen, this is the effect on the market. But I think that multiple ones can happen. So number two uh, on the doomsday list, and this really re I think will require the most simplest terms that you can manage. Sure. Uh, Japan goes full kaizen. <laughs> What the fuck does that mean? I mean, really take us through. All right. Through Kaizen is efficiency, right? So um, I, I couldn't find I couldn't find the Japanese word for ape shit, but um, <laughs> so here here's simplest terms: Japan stops buying U.S. Treasuries and starts selling them. That's the simplest term. If they do that, they're doing it to support the yen. So if Japan gets serious. And so far, they've not. They, well, they did, and then they pivoted back already. It took them like a week, right? In December, they said, we're, we're, we're going to target inflation, and we're going to push inflation up. And, and then a week later, they said, well, no, we're, we're going to extend this, this current situation in terms of not having an inflation goal or an interest rate goal. Uh, we're we're going to have loose monetary policy. But if they, they, if they stop buying U.S. Treasuries, um, then... Or, or worse. Actually, can, we, can I pause you right there? Let's, sure. uh, let's get even more basic. Uh, they would stop buying U.S. Treasuries. Why? So um, they would stop buying. So think of a country as you. You only have a certain amount of money in your pocket. Okay. You can only do so many things with that money because it's a finance supply. Same thing with Japan. They can either use their money to buy U.S. Treasuries and finance the U.S. debt, or they can use their money to buy yen and strengthen their own currency. As of late, what they've been doing is they've been buying U.S. Treasuries. If they stop and start supporting their own economy and their own currency and start buying yen, 
it'll strengthen the end, but more importantly, it will remove a one of the largest counterparties that takes down U.S. debt, supply and demand. You have less buyers for U.S. debt, then the U.S. government has to pay more in interest, right, to attract investors. That pushes interest rates back up. You push interest rates back up, um, then that's a serious headwind for any risk asset. Okay. In other words, that's inflationary for Absolutely. the United States, right? That's yep. the whole fight that the U.S. government has been on for the last two years, correct? Correct. And let's let's make a. I want to make a note that back in November, you know, everyone had all of a sudden started talking about the the inflation war is done, and I said, nope, it's not done. It's it's. And all of a sudden, here we have they're talking using the same word they used last spring, which was it's sticky. Remember, Powell came out last January and said, you know what, we're going to start reducing liquidity because we're winning the war on inflation. I said, no, you're not. Then they came out and they said, it's sticky. I said, no, it's not. It's going up. Now they said it was going up. Then in, in August, they said, OK, you know, it is going up, but we think we we can control it. And what I'm saying is right now, the, the, the Fed is saying, look, we've got inflation under control. We've achieved soft landing. And yet I'm looking at Home insurance, home insurance costs. I'm looking at medical costs. I'm looking at food costs, and I'm saying there's no the inflation isn't down, it's up, and so so it will make a bad situation even worse if Japan says, you know what, we're going to stop buying U.S. debt. We're going to support our own currency because that's going to make um, that's going to make products around the world cost more. Can I ask maybe the obvious question here, which is why wouldn't Japan, why wouldn't Japan support their own country rather than the U.S.? There must be a financial reason, right? The strength of the U.S. dollar being good yeah. business, so to speak. But help us understand. I mean, it seems almost too obvious for a country not to act in its own best interest. So why well, I, they now? yeah, you know, you know, for the last twenty years, Japan has been in a deflationary spiral, which means that. You've got a population of savers. They're not spending the money. They're not consuming. And so our, our, the world is driven by consumption. So GDP grows because of consumption. People buy things up and down the supply chain. Japan, yeah, they buy things, but relative to the size of their economy, um, they are much better savers. Uh, in addition, you have an aging population, too, that no longer contributes to the economy, but is a draw on the economy. Sounds familiar because it's what the U.S. is going to be entering. And so Jap the, the, the Japanese response or the way they've managed it is they've tried to stimulate their economy by artificially keeping interest rates low. Okay? The, in fact, there was at one point a couple years ago, if you want to put money in a Japanese bank, you paid the bank. You, know, you didn't get a half a percent interest. You had to pay the bank a half a percent. And so they're trying to reverse that. Okay? Um, and, and why they would buy U.S. Treasuries, Num there's two reasons. Number one, they're, they're our largest trading partner. Number two, they're a, they're a military and political ally, too. And so Japan has been, you know, up to their eyeballs in this whole manipulation of oil and manipulation of the markets. They've been the primary partner in doing that uh, through the carry trade. But, you know, Japan having to defend their currency um, I think is going to become more of uh, on their radar because of the deteriorating economic conditions globally. So the very thing, loose credit, has created an environment where things are getting so bad for individual countries that they're going to have to pivot towards protecting their own economy as opposed to helping out the U.S. And it's also the case, correct me if I'm wrong, that... For historical reasons, Japan owns more U.S. debt than any other country. So they're right. somehow this tiny little island, but they've been the special snowflake, so to speak. Yeah. Is that yeah, I've always, you know, it's, look, I, I, am, I, I am, I don't have academic proof, but I look at Japan as being one of our, our partners in, in the great money laundering scheme that happens globally, okay? Um the other problem with Japan is the Japanese government owns 50% of the ETFs. It's a nationalized stock market. Okay. Again, 
it is not a free trading market completely. And so not only do you have the Japanese government knee deep in debt, not only do you have them with a two decade issue of deflation, but they also are the largest single owner of risk assets in Japan. That is a very bad formula. Very, very bad. And so um, what happens if their stock portfolio starts realizing losses? What if the market goes down? They own 50% of the ETFs. Uh, how are they going to meet their budgetary numbers? How are they going to provide for services for their citizens? Well, they can either continue to finance U.S. debt or pull that money back. And that's what I think, that's what I think is happening. But they just haven't, they, they, they sort of, uh, you know, back when they, uh, a, a long period of 30 days ago when they say they were pivoting and then the next day, they, next week they switched, they're going to have to pivot again. They're going to pivot back towards, we're going to defend our economy. It will, it will be every man for itself because that's what human nature is. And so if Japan gets very serious about doing it, um, it's not good for the U.S. markets. And again, it's not good for U.S. markets because by selling U.S. debt instead of buying it, selling pressure lowers the prices of bonds, which increases the rates that exactly. you get for them, which exactly. causes an extra pressure for uh, inflationary pressure for the federal government to deal with. Absolutely. And that's why I think, right, uh, Mr. Not Advice is saying the higher for longer scenario is probabilistically more likely than not. Absolutely. And, and, and one final thing, people, you know, the average citizen today in the U.S. has been, uh, their, their thinking has been warped by, you know, 15 years of stimulus. Look, prior to 1991, you know, real, real interest rates were somewhere between that four and a half and five percent rate. Okay, so the fact that mortgage rates are down at one percent is that's what's out of whack. That's what's causing this huge gap of of uh, ex, uh, perception of what is normal. You know, one point three percent thirty year rates are not normal. They didn't exist prior to two thousand and one. You know, five, five and a half percent of real rates, that's normal. So it's trying to wean the market off of that. But the problem is there are so many of these bad bubbles have been created that I'm one of those people that says, well, they're not all going to disappear naturally, safely by themselves. Structurally, they can't. And so Japan is one flashpoint. Crikey, that has been a pretty serious bit of doom mongering. I'm kind of grateful I'm wearing my zombie cat T-shirt today because... Uh, <laughs> uh, like he is he is getting ahead of some of the dooms we're going to talk about later this has been such a long and deep conversation it's gonna be a shame to squash it all into one tiny episode so let's break it up here and um let's let's have a little wrap up christoph and then let's come back next week and go deeper into mr nod of vice's five other dooms we've only talked about two dooms there are five other monstrous situations facing the world that's pretty frightening yeah, who, whose idea was it to invite this guy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm normally an optimistic person, too. <laughs> That's right, Vulture. <laughs> Vultures are always optimistic that there's going to be some good breakfast on That's Sunday. That's right. There will be a carcass there for me to, to find value in. <laughs> Yeah, so that's right. That's right. Uh, all you jungle spirits out there. Um, I mean, you know, life's complicated. Uh, there's so much going on in the world right now. And I think what what Badger and Monkey as as your investing friends are hoping to do is give you an unbiased look at all angles. And the more educated we are, the more uh, hopefully the better decisions we can make with our investing dollars. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, overview of Bitcoins, ETFs, uh, commercial real estate, regional banks, and Japan going full Kaizen. Uh, until we meet again for the next episode, this was uh, Wall Street Wildlife with special guest, Mr. Not Advice. You can find him once again at Mr. Not Advice, both on X and on his website, mrnotadvice.com. And if you're uh, looking to connect with Christoph or myself, you can find me at 7 Luke Hallard, and Christoph is at 7 Flying Platypus. 
Let us know what you think. Do you buy into some of these dooms? Are you holding Bitcoin? Are you hoarding it? Are you about to spread your money around a ton of different banks to protect yourself? We'd be interested in your feedback. Yep. Uh, also, right, check out the YouTubes. Uh, click, press, smash, do all the things to the subscribe <laughs> button. That, that will keep uh, us and Mr. Not Advice in business. Okay, so we apologize in advance. We're going to have two gloomy back-to-back -back episodes. But tune in next week for Dooms number three to seven. A reminder that the people on this program may hold positions in the companies that are mentioned. Buying and selling stock carries financial risk, which could include loss of capital. The views in this program should not be taken as personalized advice. Before acting on any of the information provided, listeners are encouraged to consult a financial or tax professional.